good sense of what we think a company is worth. And we buy it on sale. And when the market's way up, we don't buy. And we view this as one of the most exciting and productive times, certainly in my career, because you can, it's like being a kid in a candy store. And so we carefully deploy shareholders' capital. And like Chris and his family, you know, we have all our own money up. And that really changes your behavior as, a, as an investor and an asset manager when your bacon is frying with everybody else's bacon. So, so, so David, so what have you actually been doing when you say you're taking advantage of, of the, the kind of market volatility? And I, and I noticed that you said you've been upgrading the, in the quality. And I always thought that you had really high quality companies to begin with. So, so, so give us an example of what you've been doing. Well, you know, what's so unusual is that the best is on sale. AAA is on sale now. And, you know, usually as a value investor, you had to buy a can of dented soup. Mm -hmm. No longer, or soup with a dented can. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what have we been doing? I mean, we've, we've been adding to, um, you know, really high quality companies around the world. I mean, we bought more Genting, we've bought more Richemont, we've bought, uh, you know, we've added to oil and gas because we think that, you know, it's a diminishing asset and it's very hard to get. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, there's all these consumer companies that make things that people absolutely have to own. And so, Anyway, I'm enthusiastic. I think that right. this is a wonderful time. You know, Consuela, when you said, you know, people could buy a stock today and lose a lot of money tomorrow, mm -hmm. this is the big disconnect. You see, there's a difference between price and value, right? Price is what you pay. Value is what you get. Now, if, if, if somebody watching the show owned an apartment building, right, and they paid a million dollars, of had a few units in it, and when they bought it, it generated $70,000 of, of income after the expenses. And a few years later, it was up to eighty or ninety thousand. The fact that what somebody might pay for that building could swing all around, right? There might be one day somebody would offer them a million and a half, and the next day there's no bid. That doesn't mean the value of the building has changed just because the price has changed. So going back to what you said, people can lose a lot of money buying stocks today, tomorrow. It depends what the business is worth. Now, if they're forced to sell then you're absolutely right. Stocks are a very dangerous asset class to be in if you're thinking, I need to raise money for three months from now or for one year from now or two years. But if you can get in systematically over time, then lower prices and volatility, just like David said, is your friend. And if you can think of the underlying businesses and the difference between price and value, then the market volatility becomes much less unsettling. So you're, you're an advocate of dollar cost averaging, essentially, yes. in, in high quality companies. It's huge. It's, it's something that works so well. It's no wonder that Ben Graham wrote a chapter about it, that it met. And yet somehow people think, no, when prices go up, I get more excited because the world's safer. I'll invest more. When prices are down, I'm panicked. I'll wait on the sidelines for it to get better. That is destructive, self-destructive behavior. And investors destroy the returns over time by getting in after things have gone up, getting out after they've gone down. If there's one thing they could change, it wouldn't even be to reverse that. That's too hard. But if they can simply be disciplined, do the same amount every month or every quarter or every year, average in, rebalance, have that discipline, they'll be very, get very satisfactory returns over time. So, so, so one of your hallmarks, David, as well, is you, you've purchased a, a lot of internationally based companies. Mm -hmm. Is that still going to be a major theme of yours, that, that it's, you know, rather than be a, a U.S.-centric or U.S.-based company, that, that you're looking uh, even for companies that are not only doing business overseas, but that are actually based overseas. Why does, has that happened the way it has? I think the world has just, it's become smaller. Mm -hmm. And it used to be that, you know, the U.S. was sort of economically the center of the world, and we aren't anymore. And so, you know, with the market really selling off, we bought more U.S. companies. So, but, so you have been buying more U.S. companies, oh, yeah. again, because the prices are attractive. Yeah. Correct. You know, I like mean, we bought as MasterCard. MasterCard. You know, right. and uh, we own the Norfolk Southern Railroad. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, but, you know, what we've really found is that there's all these great companies based around the world and that they no longer have to be based in North America. Who'd have thunk it? Mm -hmm. But the world has changed, and that's what I mean by the world has changed for the better because, you know, a lot of these folks were educated here or elsewhere and, and have taken the principles of, you know, and applied them at home. And so I think... That's why I'm excited. I think that there's really an entrepreneurial bent in the world, and that usually brings
prosperity and you know better health and better lifestyles and you both are self-described value investors and you both own Google so David Winters I never thought I would see Google in the Wintergreen fund you know it was tell me about that one. it was really simple first of all it's a great product you know and I think you know the economics of a business are actually getting better it's becoming more global they keep innovating but you know you could just take the cash Strip the cash out of the stock price, and you were paying, I think, at one point eight times earnings. And you know the management seems to have, you know, they do no harm ethos, which really is, I think, very powerful. And it creates so much value for the advertisers. I mean, the people that advertise on Google, whether they're auto insurance companies or trial lawyers or, or <laughs> pizza shops, they'll tell you those are the best dollars they spend in advertising, better than cable TV, better than newspapers, better than broadcast media, better than magazines. The best dollars they spend are the dollars they spend on Google. So it's hugely valuable. But I would touch on one thing David said. I would say, we, I agree. I actually also have a very high regard for the management in terms of their fanaticism, fo focus, culture, the one concern is capital discipline, because one of the things we've seen over and over in technology is these cash piles build up and build up, and management somehow says, well, we're, we're rich, we're entrepreneurs, we have plenty of money, we'll just keep that for a rainy day. They have, certainly, they view share repurchase as somehow an admission of failure, and yet they don't look back and say, what's been the best performing tech stock for the last 70 years, right, IBM? Mm -hmm. One of the things that made IBM great was capital discipline. And I think Microsoft Buying is, back shares. Yep. Right? I think Microsoft has got that message. I think that you're seeing a generation of technology companies and that's the one thing I worry about with Google is this 